At one time, you were a commercial pilot for Nakamura Lines. How long was the run from Jinx till we made it? Twelve days if nothing broke down. Just long enough to get to know the prettiest passenger aboard, while the autopilot did everything for me but wear my uniform. Sirius to Procyon is a distance of four light years. Our ship would make the trip in five minutes. You've lost your mind. No. But that was almost a light year a minute. I couldn't visualize it. Then suddenly I did visualize it, and my mouth fell open. For what I saw was the galaxy opening before me. We know so little beyond our own small neighborhood of the galaxy. But with a ship like that... Hey, welcome to Sci-Fi Secrets. This is the second Beowulf Schaefer story that Larry Niven wrote. It was published in 1966 in Worlds of If, the same year as Neutron Star, the story, not the novel. The novel came out in 68. At the core is both one of the first and one of the most impactful stories in known space. The events that occur in this have far-reaching consequences, even felt in the newest additions to the universe, the Fleet of Worlds novels. Beowulf Schaefer was in the Institute of Knowledge on Jinx when a puppeteer approached him. After his last dealings with the puppeteers, he was understandably apprehensive. This puppeteer, like the last, had an offer for him. The puppeteers had invented a new version of the hyperdrive. While well, the Hyperdrive 1 could travel 4 light years in 12 days, or about a light year every 3 days, the Hyperdrive 2 could make that same trip in 5 minutes, or just under a light year a minute. They were offering Beowulf 100,000 stars for a 2 month trip. They estimated it would take 25 days to get to the core, hence 25 days back, barring any stops of course. So they gave him a total of 4 months to complete the journey. Any slower, and they would start to deduct from that amount, 2,000 stars a day. The only way out of the contract was if something happened to the ship or equipment the puppeteers provided. Without thinking, Beowulf accepts. But just like before, the puppeteers had thrown him a curveball. As soon as he began to travel in the one and only Hyperdrive 2 ship, which he had named the Longshot, he noticed a problem. On the ships he was used to flying, he only needed to look at the mass pointer once every few hours to keep from flying into a star. You see, trying to fly in hyperspace near a mass like a star always resulted in the ship disappearing, never to be heard from again. No one knew why exactly. Many theories were out there, but none of them could be proven. Any attempt to study the phenomenon just resulted in lost ships and instruments. Now this by itself would not be such a big problem but no machine yet made could interpret the mass pointer, the only way to detect a mass while you're still in hyperspace. So a living thinking creature must watch it, in this case, Beowulf Schaefer. So when the high speed of the Hyperdrive 2 motor was combined with the ever-thickening stars as he approached the core of the galaxy, this meant he must constantly monitor the mass pointer and constantly either change course or drop out of hyperspace to choose a new path. Less than a week in, he knew he wouldn't make it in time at this rate. Luckily, he came up with a plan. He called his contact at General Products and had them send him maps of the galaxy. With those, he was able to get into a space between the arms of the galaxy. Gone were the obscuring masses of dust and gas. A billion years ago, they must have been swept up for fuel by the hungry, crowded stars. The core lay before me like a great jeweled sphere. I'd expected it to be a gradual thing, a thick mass of stars thinning out into the arms. There was nothing gradual about it. A clear ball of multicolored light, five or six thousand light years across, nestled in the heart of the galaxy, sharply bound by the last of the dust clouds. I was 10,400 light years from the center. The red stars were the biggest and brightest. I could actually pick some of them out as individuals. 
The rest was a finger painting in fluorescent green and blue. But those red stars, they would have sent Aldebaran back to kindergarten. It was all so bright. I needed the telescope to see black between the stars. I'll show you how bright it was. Is it night where you are? Step outside and look at the stars. What color are they? And Harry's may show red if you're near enough in the system. So will Mars. Sirius may show bluish. But all the rest are white pinpoints. Why? Because it's dark. Your day vision is in color, but at night you see black and white like a dog. The core suns were bright enough for color vision. I'd pick a planet here. Not in the core itself, but right out here, with the core on one side, and on the other side, a dimly starred dust cloud forming their strange convoluted curtain. Man, what a view. Imagine that flaming jeweled sphere rising in the east, hundreds of times as big as binary shows on Jinx, and without the constant feeling binary gives you, the fear that the orange world will fall on you, for the vast, twinkling core is only starlight, lovely and harmless. I'd pick my world now and stake a claim. When the puppeteers got their drive fixed up, I'd have the finest piece of real estate in the known universe. If I could only find a habitable planet. If only I could find it twice. Hell, I'd be lucky to find my way home from here. I shifted into hyperspace and went back to work. An hour and 50 minutes, one lunch break and two rest breaks and 50 light years later, I noticed something peculiar in the core. It was even clearer then, if not much bigger. I'd passed through the almost transparent wisps of the last dust cloud. Not too near the center of the sphere was a patch of white, bright enough to make the green and blue and red look dull around it. I looked for it again at the next break, and it was a little brighter. It was brighter again at the next break. Beowulf Schaefer? Yeah, I- Why did you use the dictaphone to call me a cowardly two-headed monster? You were off the line. I had to use the dictaphone. That is sensible, yes. We puppeteers have never understood your attitude towards a natural caution. My boss was peeved, though you couldn't tell from his voice. I'll go into that if you like, but it's not why I called. Explain, please. I'm all for caution. Discretion is the better part of valor and like that. You can even be a good businessman because it's easier to survive with lots of money. But you're so damned concerned with various kinds of survival that you aren't even interested in something that isn't a threat. Nobody but a puppeteer would have turned down my offer to describe the core. You forget the Kazinti. Oh, the Kazinti. Who expects rational behavior from Kazinti? You whip them when they attack... You reluctantly decide not to exterminate them. You wait till they build up their strength, and when they attack, you whip them again. Meanwhile, you sell them foodstuffs and buy their medals and employ them where you need good games theorists. It's not as if they were a real threat. They'll always attack before they're ready. The Kazinti are carnivores. Where we are interested in survival, carnivores are interested in meat alone. They conquer because subject peoples can supply them with food. They cannot do menial work. Animal husbandry is alien to them. They must have slaves or be barbarians roaming the forests for meat. Why should they be interested in what you call abstract knowledge? Why should any thinking being, if the knowledge has no chance of showing a profit? In practice, your description of the core would attract only an omnivore. You'd make a good case if it were not for the fact that most sentient races are omnivores. We have thought long and hard on that. Yeah, cats. I was going to have to think long and hard on that. Why did you call, Beowulf Schaefer? Oh, yeah. Look, I know you don't want to know what the core looks like, but I see something that might represent personal danger. You have access to information I don't. May I proceed? You may. Ha, I was learning to think like a puppeteer. Was that good? I told my boss about the blazing, strangely shaped white patch in the core. When I turned the telescope on it, it nearly blinded me. Grade 2 sunglasses don't give me any details at all. It's just a shapeless white patch, but so bright that the stars in front look like black dots with colored rims. I'd like to know what's causing it. It sounds very unusual. 
Pause. Is the white color uniform? Is the brightness uniform? Just a second. I use the scope again. The color is, but the brightness isn't. I see dimmer areas inside the patch. I think the center is fading out. Use the telescope to find a nova star. There ought to be several in such a large mass of stars. I tried it. Presently I found something. A blazing disk of a peculiar blue-white color with a dimmer, somewhat smaller red disk half in front of it. That had to be a nova. In the core of Andromeda Galaxy, and in what I'd seen of our own core, the red stars were the biggest and brightest. I found one. Comment. A moment more, I saw what he meant. It's the same color as the patch. Something like the same brightness, too. But what could make a patch of supernovas go off all at once? You have studied the core. The stars of the core are an average of half a light year apart. They are even closer near the center. And no dust clouds dim their brightness. When stars are that close, they shed enough light on each other to increase materially each other's temperature. Stars burn faster and age faster in the core. I see that. Since the core stars age faster, a much greater portion are near the supernova stage than in the arms. Also, all are hotter considering their respective ages. If a star were a few millennia from the supernova stage and a supernova exploded half a light year away, estimate the probabilities. They might both blow, and then two could set off a third, and the three might take a couple more. Yes. Since a supernova lasts on the order of one human standard year, the chain reaction would soon die out. Your patch of light must have occurred in this way. That's a relief. Knowing what I did, I mean, I'll take pictures going in. As you say. The patch kept expanding as I went in, still with no more shape than a veil nebula, getting brighter and bigger. It hardly seemed fair, what I was doing. The light which the patch novas had taken 50 years to put out... I covered in an hour, moving down the beam at a speed at which made the universe itself seem unreal. At the fourth rest period, I dropped out of hyperspace, looked down through the floor while the cameras took their pictures, glanced away from the patch for a moment, and found myself blinded by the tangerine afterimages. I had to put on a pair of grade one sunglasses. Out of the packet of 20 which every pilot carries for working near suns during takeoff and landing. It made me shiver to think that the patch was still nearly 10,000 light years away. Already, the radiation must have killed all life in the core. If there ever had been any life there. My instruments on the hull showed radiation like a solar flare. At the next stop, I needed grade 2 sunglasses. Somewhat later, grade 3. Then 4. The patch became a great bright amoeba reaching twisting tentacles of fusion fire deep into the vitals of the core. In hyperspace, the sky was jammed bumper to bumper, so to speak, but I never thought of stopping. As the core came closer, the patch grew like something alive, something needing ever more food. I think I knew, even then. Night came. The control room was a blaze of light. I slept in the relaxed room to the tune of laboring temperature control. Morning, and I was off again. The radiation meter snarled its death song, louder during each rest break. If I'd been planning to go outside, I would have dropped that plan. Radiation couldn't get through a general product's hull. Nothing else can, either, except visible light. I spent a bad half hour trying to remember whether one of the puppeteer's customers saw x-rays. I was afraid to call up and ask. The mass pointer began to show a faint blue blur. Gas is thrown outward from the patch. I had to keep changing sunglasses. Sometime during the morning of the next day, I stopped. There was no point in going further. Beowulf Schaefer, have you become attached to the sound of my voice? I have other work than supervising your progress. I would like to deliver a lecture on abstract knowledge. Surely it can wait until your return. The galaxy is exploding. There was a strange noise, then... Repeat, please. Have I got your attention? Yes. Good. I think I know the reason why so many sentient races are omnivores. Interest in abstract knowledge is a symptom of pure curiosity. Curiosity must be a survival trait. Must we discuss this? Very well. You may well be right. Others have made the same suggestion, including puppeteers. 
But how has our species survived at all? You must have some substitute for curiosity. Increased intelligence, maybe. You've been around long enough to develop it. Our hands can't compare with your mouths for tool building. If a watchmaker had taste and smell in his hands, he still wouldn't have the strength of your jaw or the delicacy of those knobs around your lips. When I want to know how old a sentient race is, I watch what he uses for hands and feet. Yes, human feet are still adapting to their task of keeping you erect. You propose, then, that our intelligence has grown sufficiently to ensure our survival without depending on your hit or miss method of learning everything you can for the sheer pleasure of learning. Not quite. Our method is better. If you hadn't sent me to the core for publicity, you'd never have known about this. You say the galaxy is exploding? Rather, it finished exploding some 9,000 years ago. I'm wearing grade 20 sunglasses, and it's still too bright. A third of the core has gone already. The patch is spreading at nearly the speed of light. I don't see that anything can stop it until it hits the gas clouds beyond the core. There was no comment. I went on. A lot of the inside of the patch has gone out, but all of the surface is new novas. And remember, the light I'm seeing is 9,000 years old. Now, I'm going to read you a few instruments. Radiation, 210. Cabin temperature normal, but you can hear the whine of the temperature control. The mass indicator shows nothing but a blur ahead. I'm turning back. Radiation 210? How far are you from the edge of the core? About 4,000 light years, I think. I can see the plumes of incandescent gas starting to form in the near side of the patch, moving towards galactic north and south. It reminds me of something. Aren't there pictures of exploding galaxies in the Institute? Many, yes. It has happened before, Beowulf Schaefer. This is bad news. When the radiation from the core reaches our worlds, it will sterilize them. We puppeteers will soon need considerable amounts of money. Shall I release you from your contract, paying you nothing? I laughed. I was too surprised to even get mad. No? Surely you do not intend to enter the core. No? Look, why do you- And by the conditions of our contract, you forfeit. Wrong again. I'll take pictures of these instruments. When a court sees the readings on the radiation meter and the blue blur on the mass indicator, they'll know something's wrong with them. Nonsense. Under evidence drugs, you will explain the readings. Sure. And the court will know you tried to get me to go right into the center of that holocaust. You know what they'll say to that? But how can a court of law find against a recorded contract? The point is that they'll want to. Maybe they'll decide that we're both lying and the instruments really did go haywire. Maybe they'll find a way to say the contract was illegal. But they'll find against you. Want to make a side bet? No. You have won. Come back. The core was a lovely multicolored jewel when it disappeared below the lens of the galaxy. I'd have liked to visit it again someday, but there aren't any time machines. Hey, thanks for watching. I really appreciate you staying this long, and since you did, hopefully that means you like my channel. So I'd really appreciate it if you would like, comment, and most importantly, subscribe, so I can see you back here for the next one. Take care.